My name is Gail Ekus. I'm the co-coordinator of the Arizona Geographic Alliance, and I'm going to share with you a lesson called Dog's Tales, an introduction to map reading. Now this lesson I have labeled as grades two through high school, and you may be saying, how can a second grader do the same thing as a high school student? And it's because there are nine elements to map reading, but when you start with second graders, you don't introduce them all at one time. You introduce a few, and then as the years go on, you can keep introducing more and more elements. This lesson takes about one class period. The overview. Map skills are basic to geographic understanding. Students need a system and, and a way to analyze and organize maps. So Dog's Tales gives them a standard to use that can be used not only for maps they make, but looking at commercial maps. Therefore, the purpose of this lesson is that students will learn the nine elements of Dog's Tales. All right, materials. You're going to need a couple of things that um, are not always found in a classroom. First of all, you need a collection of maps. And I get maps all over the place. Um, I get them from National Geographic. I get them from tourist bureaus. I get them from national parks. I get them from rental companies. I get them from AAA. But you just want to have a wide variety of maps. Then you need sticky labels, and these labels need to be removable. It's important to have them removable because once they affix them to the map, you don't want them to stick and ruin the maps. So they need to be removable ones. And the third thing you need are baggies, and in the baggies you're going to put the arrows for dog's tails, and you're going to put the sticky dots. And then with this lesson comes a variety of worksheets that you'll be seeing as we go along. The objective for this lesson is students are going to be able to name, locate, and use the essential parts of a map. I always start this lesson by explaining what's an acronym, because not every student knows what an acronym is, and Dog's Tales is an acronym. So as you know, an acronym means that each letter stands for a word. So the D is going to stand for something, the O, and when we put them all together, it comes up with a cute acronym called Dog's Tales. Now when you're using this with younger students, we're going to use the acronym TOADS, but I'll get into that in a little while. And then you're going to explain that whenever we get a new map or whenever we create a map, we should be thinking about the terms or the elements of what makes a good map and Dog's Tales. You're going to give the students a worksheet, and the worksheet's going to have the acronym on it. And then you can either use an overhead, or you can use a PowerPoint to explain the parts of the map. I'm going to use the PowerPoint that will be included. And as we are talking about what each element stands for, they should be recording this on their worksheet. All right, and I always do it kind of like a question-answer kind of thing. So I would say, what do you think the D stands for in Dog's Tales? Has something to do with a map? What could it be a D word? And one of the sharper students is going to say direction. And that is a great word. But we're going to save that word, and we're going to save it until we get to a different letter. So I say, nope, not for this one. Save that idea. Keep it in your mind, because it's important. But we're going on. What, what's a D stand for? And hopefully, eventually, somebody comes up with date. Because date is essential on a map. You want a map that's reliable. You want a current map. Old maps are not good. Even with GPS units, you have to update them. All right, and then go to the O. What's the O going to stand for? And hopefully, somebody comes up with orientation. This is your direction word. Is there a compass rose on the map? So we have D is date, O is orientation. G. G stands for grid. And there are two kinds of grids that are often found on maps. You have an alphanumeric, that's like B3, J4, it's like doing bingo. Or there's latitude, longitude. Now latitude and longitude is introduced in about the fourth grade in Arizona. So you can start getting kids used to the idea of these two kinds of grids. S. 
We're going to use this S for scale. Scale is introduced in about the fourth grade, and it's important that kids understand the unit of measurement on the scale. You'll see in the little sample on the PowerPoint slide, you've got two measurements. You've got miles, and you've got kilometers. So the, the scale may be converted from one to the other, or it may just be miles. The T. T stands for title. The title of the map. And this is something kids should always read first. It's not, you know, do all the problems and then figure out, oh, this is a map of Arkansas. The A word we're going to cheat a little bit on. It should be a word that starts with a C, but the C word small children aren't going to remember. So we're going to use the A word because it does make sense to a small child. And the C word is, or the A word, I'm sorry, is author. And the C word would be cartographer. So the author is who makes the map what they're really called as a cartographer, you can see from the little example. Our particular cartographer is Barbara Trapetaluri. The I in dog's tail stands for index. Is there an alphabetical listing of the places on the map? Most road maps have an alphabetical listing because they want you to be able to find Ajo or Benson or whatever on the map. But not all maps do have an alphabetical listing. The L in dog's tail, legend. Is there a place on the map that explains the symbols on the map? Now, in this particular map in the PowerPoint slide, you can see there's a bunch of symbols in the legend. There's a gorilla, there's a cave. So you can see that we've used lots of symbols, and they are identified in the legend. And the last S you could use for symbol. If I was teaching younger children, symbol is a logical last S. In fact, you could substitute scale earlier on and do symbol and make this last S scale. But I'm going to show you something that's a little bit different. OK, here's your symbols. But I'm going to show you situation. Now, situation is when you are showing one place in relationship to another. So in this map of Jerusalem as the old city, you can see there are various quarters, the four quarters of the old city. But I was afraid that dealing with this map in 12-year-olds, that they would then think if they went to Jerusalem, they'd go through the gates, and this is what they'd find. Well, Jerusalem's a modern city. So I didn't want to leave them with the misconception, this is all there is to Jerusalem. And instead, we had a, a situation put in. So what is here? is actually right here so that they can see the big city around the old city is the modern Jerusalem. And that was just one of the things that I thought was kind of important for kids to understand, but it's a good example of situation. So when we start working with students, you can start with scale, you can start with symbols, but then eventually by the time they get to the high school standard, they need to know situation. All right, so what do we do with this lesson? We have our baggie of um, labels. And what they're going to do is they're going to, you're going to divide the students into groups of two and give each group a baggie of labels. And you're going to give them a map that they have never seen before. OK, so let's say I gave them my map here. And then they are going to affix the labels to the map, they can use either side or both sides to find all of the elements they can find on that particular map. Now, they may not find every element on every single map. That's one of the learning curves on this, is that not every map has every element. But they're going to take their labels, and they're going to find as many as they can on their particular map. So they unfold their map, and then they stick their labels on. And here's an example. Okay, they just, this says author, the cartographer's down here, so they just stick it on with the sticky dot and make it point towards the element. 
Now, it usually takes kids about five, ten minutes to do this piece of the, the um, a lesson. So give them a chance to work with their map. If you want to, you can do some sort of a, 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 a class activity at the end about how many found all the elements, what kind of map were you using. Just to give you a clue, road maps have the most. Road maps almost always have the most elements. And then you have the students take their map, their labels off. Okay, they can pass the map to somebody else. Okay. That goes to somebody else, they get a new map, and then they can start all over again and do this one. Now, how many times you do this depends on class time, depends on how fast your students are learning. But once you have them repeating the process, it becomes like a new puzzle, okay? It's a new map. They have different places to look for the things. So it is a new activity. But at some point, we hope that students actually have learned all the elements now and they get it. And so at some point, you want to have one assessment that all students can utilize. So you give them one map, okay, that everybody has the same map. And then you give them a worksheet, which is included with the um, materials, that has them then write the title of the map. They have to draw on the compass rows. They have to identify if there's a scale and what the scale is. And so they have to work through the worksheet using the same map, which gives you an easy way to grade what you've done or what they've done. OK, extensions. You always reinforce this whenever you start a new map. And um, then when kids design their own maps, it's great because they know what elements they need to have. Now all you have to do is say dog's tail it. And they have to have a date, and they have to have an orientation, they have to have a grid, they have to have a scale, and so they can proceed. If there's something you don't want them to have, they don't have to have an index, then you can say dog's tail it minus the I. And then they get the idea of what to do. Now, this the particular lesson also has an ELL adaptation, and it goes through using it with younger children, and the acronym TOADS. The purpose and the overview are all the same, all the objectives are the same, but we're just shortening the acronym now to TOADS, and we're going to use this with ELLs. We have the SIOP elements delineated. You'll see that they're bolded. We have the TESOL standards. We have the um, ELL 1 and 3 for reading and writing standards. And this particular lesson comes with a couple of things that are different. For example, this one has vocabulary cards. And with the vocabulary cards, the idea is you can print them off so that you can help the English language learners learn new information. And they're supposed to cut the cards in half, then they fold them, and they have like a flash card. So here's orientation shows direction, or it's the compass rows, and then they have a picture to help them learn what the words mean. Now you'll notice the key vocabulary for toads are title, the name of the map, author, who made the map, orientation, the compass rows, the date, which is the date the map was made, and you can use scale or symbol depending on which one you want to start with. I would suggest you're actually starting with symbol, but you could start with scale. It's up to you. And for the LL version, you can use little plastic toads with the words on it. If you think the plastic toads are going to make it cuter, more interactive for the students, that's up to you. And the procedures are basically the same. You go through what does the acronym TOADS stand for, have them work on the worksheet and write in the words. But they also make a little booklet. So they make a little dictionary. And their little TOADS dictionary has their title page. Then it has the word title. And they have to illustrate it down below. Orientation. Then they illustrate it down below. Author, date, and scale. Then you divide them into pairs. You give them a map. And once again, they're going to be identifying the toads. So here's the author down here. And then you would put the arrow for the title. And once again, reaffirm that not all elements are found in all maps. 
It's very hard for them to believe that once they've learned something, they should be able to find it, but they won't be able to find it on every single map. Again, you're going to practice, and with younger kids, you can always use learning centers. You can put a map out each day and have them go by and toads it. And then as the students are learning, you can increase what they learn from just toads to add some new words. Maybe they now know symbols and scale, so it can be toadses. Or if you want them to do grid, then it can be green toads, g toads. Or if you want them to add you know, other letters, just keep adding them as you think your students are able to handle more elements of how to read a map. The assessment has a worksheet again. You give them all the same map, and then they can identify off of the map what is the title, the orientation, the author, the date, and symbol or scale, whichever you want to use. And again, reinforce this whenever they do map reading, and you can have them create maps. In fact, in the earlier standards for grades K through 3, 4, they have them doing classroom maps, school maps, things like that. This is a great chance to apply TOADS.